Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you for making time and effort to be here. So tell us about the steps that you're taking to make these services available to you know, low-income earners. So, um, so as, as you said, interventional radiology is basically modern medicine where we um, use small tools and find ways to do things in the body without having to open people up. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, in medicine, when you go to modern technology, things obviously get more expensive. Uh, we, we understand that and uh, we recognize that. So we also have a mandate to make sure that the services are also available to low resource patients, right? And we've done that in several ways. One is education and training, right? So we started a, a fellowship program in interventional radiology, the first in Nigeria. It's really not really recognized academically yet, but we had to do something. So we have a fellow from the University of Ibadan that's joined us for the last year, uh, Dr. Peter, who's uh, been with us for the last year and is gonna be with us for another year. And the goal is to get somebody new from the public hospitals about every two years and transfer skills to him so he could then go back and serve those patients because we can't do that directly. Uh, the other way we've thought about uh, serving low resource patients is uh, a foundation. So we started a foundation about four years ago called the Kola Wale Interventional Radiology Foundation, uh, named after my dad. And the reason we started that foundation is, you know, what I do is so specific and a lot of patients require those services, especially in an emergent setting. So for example, during the COVID period, uh, we had quite a few young patients who were in dire need of interventional radiology care. One of those patients had a condition in the liver called an arterial portal um, connection where an artery was abnormally connected to a vein. And the only specialty in the world that could have taken care of this patient anywhere in the world could have been, would have been interventional radiology. Uh, one of the physicians um, at Lasut at that time recognized what he had and called us, but the patient really had no resources. But we've always had a mandate that any young patient that's an, in an emergent need of an interventional radiology procedure, and we know interventional radiology is the only option or the best option for that patient, we will take care of them. And that's been the mandate of the foundation since then. Very good, uh, Dr. Nino Lowu. Um, if you were to look at uh, the availability of your field, um, interventional radiology itself, how available is it in Nigeria currently from you know, schools churning out medical professionals and uh, in terms of accessibility as well? I know part of what you're doing now is more or less a stopgap measure and also to improve Correct. on that. But if you would just give us an idea. So just historically, I'll tell you, so before, so I started doing interventional radiology in Nigeria in 2018. Uh, before I came to Nigeria, there's a gentleman, Professor Ahijo at the University of Meduguri, who had some training outside the country and who's been doing interventional radiology. However, we started basically the most complex practice. Basically, what I, my goal was to make sure that we could provide everything that was provided outside of Nigeria in Nigeria. Obviously, that's not easy, but we've been able to accomplish that over the last four years. Uh, currently, um, we have another uh, female who's trained in Tanzania and a program in Tanzania and is back in the East trying to do, uh, do some work in interventional radiology. So we're slowly growing. But if you imagine a country of over 200 million people and you have one, two, or three interventional radiologists, yeah. that's just not enough. So we're really, really far away from where we need to be. But if you look at even developed nations like America or Europe, interventional radiologists are still really rare breeds. We don't see them that, we don't see, we, it's just not that many of us, right? So for example, uh, I get an email, about five emails every day from my colleagues in America asking if I could cover a week or, or co cover two weeks because the need is so high. Mm. So we do have two branches of interventional radiology. One is body interventional radiology, meaning we treat most things from the neck down to the toes. And then we have another branch of interventional radiology called neurointerventional radiology. And these doctors are specialized in treating conditions in the brain. And those guys are even rarer, right? So I do everything basically from the neck to the toes. The neurointerventional radiologists do the brain work. So we are now moving from providing just body interventional radiology services in Nigeria to neurointerventional radiology services where we could treat things like hemorrhagic stroke, meaning bleeding in the brain from things like cerebral aneurysms and also treat acute ischemic strokes, which is our next project. Uh, we actually did our first case in Nigeria about three years ago, um, just before the COVID uh, period started. However, we plan to accelerate our program, but the COVID period basically stopped us. Um, two weeks ago, we did our second case of a cerebral aneurysm, which uh, we talked about. Yeah, indeed. 
Um, and, and if I may come in as yes. well, I uh, also asked about uh, when we first met two weeks ago, yeah. the issue of, uh, you know, in terms of um, getting the professionals to come in yeah. uh, to also transfer the skills and, of course, even the tools to work with yes. in that uh, aspect as well. Yeah, so that's where I am now. I'm also basically uh, a student now because I have professionals that do neurointerventional radiology that I've teamed up with to come in and transfer those skills to us here back home. And as you said, so there's two professionals we have, uh, one in Dubai currently, that's a Spanish gentleman that's basically volunteered a lot of his time in basically educating me. Also Dr. Kunle Ogunbemi in London, who is also a Nigerian and has a big passion for doing this in Nigeria. But as you said, we don't have the tools available and quite honestly, we don't have the affordability available in Nigeria, right, for a lot of this advanced uh, medical technologies to be done here readily. Uh, the tools still really have to be brought from the outside. As you know, we don't produce anything in Nigeria as far as medical consumables. Uh, these are typically very expensive tools that mostly come from America or Europe. But, you know, people always said what I do, for example, was impossible in Nigeria. We've made it possible. We've made it readily available over the last four years. And I really believe neurointervention can also be possible over the next few years we just have to have dedicated people that are going to go through the, the cycles of the craziness that we go through in Nigeria to make it possible. So the tools are definitely not available, but we can get them into the country to do the work because the patients absolutely need it. I, I hear you, and I, for, it's obvious that you chose this based on passion, since you, you can count on one hand the number of uh, you know, the interventional radiologists that are available in the country. My question to you is, how is the brain drain issue that we're facing currently in Nigeria, how is it affecting your area of specialization, if at all? So good question. So I do, so I'm, I'm board certified in both diagnostic radiology, meaning I could read x-rays, MRIs, and CTs, and I'm also board certified in interventional radiology. So what's the brain drain issue, brain drain issue especially in diagnostic radiology, has been a significant detriment to patient care in Nigeria. So a few years ago, there were about 600 radiologists in Nigeria. In the last two or three years, probably about 85 of those or even more have left Nigeria. So think about it, 600 radiologists is 200 million people. That's one radiologist for over 300,000 people. And now that number is even getting less. So we saw the problem uh, about three years ago and we started a company. We started a company called Accurate Radiology. So Accurate Radiology, we do teleradiology. So if you look at a lot of the hospitals um, in Lagos now, they don't have a radiologist that sits there to read the scans. We've now provided a platform where you do a scan, you upload it to our platform, and one of our radiologists basically picks it up and reads it. But we're basically bringing in brain gain from accurate radiology, and how are we doing that? A lot of those radiologists that have left Nigeria to England, to Dubai, and all of those countries actually read those scans for Nigerian patients now from those countries. So they're certified in Nigeria, and we're giving them the platform to be able to make sure that they're still giving back to Nigerian patients. And quite honestly, what we pay them compared to what they get paid in England, I mean, it's night and day. But you could tell that they're still passionate about taking care of Nigerian patients. They just really can't be here because of you know, the big picture, having their families in a safer environment, having a, an income that's more guaranteed. But we're still making sure that we're bringing in that brain gain with the technology, even though they're not here. Very good, uh, Dr. Dinolo. But um, when you look at the, the, your foundation itself, does it also cater for post-surgery treatment? Because that's also, an, it's not just about the surgery, absolutely, but afterwards. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's a very big question. So we've, I have been very reluctant into going into <laughs> neurointervention for that specific reason, because a lot of these patients that have, you know, bleeds in the brains or big strokes, you really cannot predict how they're going to do over the next two weeks, over the next three weeks, right? So even if we provided a, a platform to do the acute intervention, what happens then, right? And that's something we're still fighting with because we really cannot be responsible for a patient over 48 hours so, of doing an intervention. Okay, so, so who takes over from there? So, we, we've, so we've worked with families so far, um, and we're very careful into making sure that we're working with families that understand that we need to be a team, right? This, is, this can be 100% charitable uh, because we can be responsible. We're not a government, and it's very important to understand that. And we don't have unlimited resources. I spent the entire week last week writing letters to companies basically to donate to us, right? And basically, this is more of a personal effort because this is something I'm passionate about. We have a board on our foundation who also helps raise money, but we don't have unlimited funds. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've made sure that we let the families understand that 
We are helping you get professionals from outside of the country. We're helping you with the supplies. We're helping you with the procedure itself. But if your, if your um, family member needs care beyond that, you will be responsible for it. And they have to sign and uh, sign an agreement with the hospital to make sure that they can be responsible for that. Well, I hope those letters that you wrote last week, or was it last week? Last I week, hope yes. they yield fruit, and it's been a pleasure having you, Thank you here so on Newsday. Founder Kola Wole, Interventional Radiology Foundation, and trained vascular and international interventional radiologist, Dr. Ahmed Ninalowo. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, Thank you. you.